Good afternoon, Ryan. How are you doing today, sir? What's going on, Mike? Happy Facebook Friday to you. And uh, really excited about this topic because I think this one is incredibly relevant right now. This answers a lot of questions for a lot of people, right? For sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, is it, you know, interest rates are up and prices are up. So we hear it all day, every day. Like, okay, is it better for me to go rent right now? Or would it be better for me to buy a house? And the answer is always, it depends, right? But right. going through and educating, you know, people on the process and the circumstances that are applicable to their lives, right? That's that's the best approach to do it. And so I figured, you know, it'd be a good good topic for us to cover today. Um, yeah, it's 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 perfect. What we want to do is walk through some of the mechanics behind other things other than just the face price of the monthly cost yeah. to determine whether or not it's a smart move and when it becomes a smart move, because I think we're going to make an argument for both options today and at least help people see it. Maybe in just a different light. That's kind of the goal with this. Yeah, for sure. There's no hard and fast answer. You know, no one size fits all. So yeah, we'll, we'll cover both ends of that. Um, anything that you want to touch on before we jump into the data that we talked about? No, I'm ready to jump in. I mean, if you want, I'll frame it up for you and I can kind of tell you what we're looking at. Yep. All right. So let me turn that on real quick. So what we did, and, and this is this is a conversation you and I had, we just thought it would be nice to share it with a lot of people. Yeah. We wanted to see, because rates have moved up, I mean, we're almost, almost double what they were last year. And then house prices have moved up significantly since last year. Does it still make sense to buy or should you just rent? And yeah we wanted to do a comparison. So what we did is we we looked at the floor of the market. We pulled up a, a home. I did a search in Palmdale and I said, look, show me anything in Palmdale, 1500 square feet or bigger. Where's the floor of the market? Well, the floor was like $2,700 yeah. unless you're getting into condos and things, right? So yeah. for a house, 2,700 bucks. That one was kind of a pile. Like, honestly, there's nobody that I know that would want to move into that one. So we chose one that would look pretty good. I mean, this house was, uh, was in East Palmdale. I just mm -hmm. used a sample here. It's $2,900 a month rent it came out yesterday, I believe. So yeah. this is relevant as of like right now. Yep. Now that same home, if it were to be on the market and sell and other homes in that area have sold would sell for around $510,000. So we yep. have to really take into consideration rates moved up to buy, to own that, it's 510, or to rent it, it's $2,900. So yeah. which way do you go? Now, the consumer is going to look a lot of times just at the monthly payment, 2,900 bucks, what is it going to be to buy? They make their decision literally that quick, but there's a whole lot more to it. And that's the stuff that we want to unpack today with this call. Yeah, for sure. And again, like, yeah, most people, people are just monthly payment oriented and right. there's nothing wrong with that. But when you're making a huge decision, <laughs> you probably should put a little bit more thought into it than that. Um, yep. Okay, so this breakdown that we have up on the screen right here, um, you know, if, if it's hard for you guys to see on your screen, uh, let us know and we can share those to you later. Um, but for talking points now, uh, you know, what's going on on the left side over here? Yeah, we'll jump, we'll, we'll drop them into like the chat later just so you can kind of pull yep. them up and see them a little bit better. But um, to, to give you just a little bit more context, so $2,900 a month to rent, you would need to make right around $100,000 a year. So a lot of landlords uh, or property managers are looking at three times rent. Yes. Ironically, to buy for 510, you'd be kind of right around the same price point. And if we're just assuming maybe a, a standard 5% down um, conventional loan, we just kind of chose that. There are down payment options that are significantly less, but we wanted to use that one um, just as a, a reference point, it's a fairly popular way to go. Just put 5% down and, and buy. Yep. So the income to qualify for either one of these is right about the same. They kind of almost mirror each other that way. Mm -hmm. And what you're looking at on the screen is you've got the $2,900 in rent kind of laid up there. And what we're doing is we're kind of backing out all of the additional cost uh, or I'm sorry, benefits on the mortgage side. So on the surface, the mortgage, and I'm going to kind of look over on my screen because it's a little bit more clear from my old weary eyes here. So if I'm looking at it, the mortgage is about 3549 and that's with a rate of five and a half percent. So we, we kind of bump that rate up a little bit. We know the market's still kind of moving high. Yep. We used five and a half percent for that. 
and we built in property taxes and insurance. So we've really got a complete payment, 5% down, 35.49. So, and that's, that's a lot of money different, right? Yeah, basically on the surface, uh, a, a pretty significantly uh, different payment. You got $636 different. So it would clearly make more sense to rent, right? Yeah, well, well it's 25%. Correct. Yes. Exactly. And and then on top of it, to rent, you've got, you know, let's call it six to eight grand to, to get in the door. You've got to put your first and last and maybe a little security deposit and that sort of thing. Yeah. And so you're probably going to need to have about that ready to go. Well, to buy in this scenario, you would need probably around 39K. And we didn't make this like super um, aggressive. We, we kind of fattened the calf a little bit. So 39 maybe cuts down a little closer to 36 or so, but I mean, it's, it's going to be pretty accurate, right? Yeah. With 5% down. So you've got more money to go in and buy your payments higher. Why in the heck would you want to buy when yeah. the rent could be significantly less? Well, there's a tax benefit. So a lot of people look at it and they go, all right, well, the tax benefit at hundred K. So I'm using the, the state taxes. I'm using the federal taxes that you would owe if you made a hundred thousand yep. dollars is $755. That's your benefit to owning. Yep. All right. So that's helping you. So to kind of stop there for a second, one thing that I go back to all the time with buyers is when they're making a leap like this and they're going, all right, 29 to, to 35, like, I don't know where I'm going to find that extra cash. If we know you're going to get this tax benefit of $755 per month, what you want to do is you want to revisit your withholdings. You want to look at your pay stub and you would, if you were going to make the case for the purchase yeah. to, try to stretch, look at your withholdings. It is absolutely ridiculous to get a $7,000 tax refund, right? Yeah. When you could use that money all year round to offset your housing costs. Yep. I see this all the time. We get people that are um, excited to get their tax refund. They're anxious, like January rolls around and they're ready to file their taxes because they want that cash, that refund yeah. to pay off a credit card. Yeah. It's like, dude, you've carried that credit card the entire year. Why are you paying it off now? Just change your withholdings, take a little bit more money back. But you know what? If it's for a credit card, that's, that's risky. If you change your withholdings, they didn't hold back as much. You may not get that refund. Um, on the mortgage, you're, you've got that write-off that's giving you that additional incentive and so that's one way to kind of make that, like bridge that gap and make it a little bit more affordable. Yep. So pause real quick on that. So yep, the, sure. how much was the, the mortgage uh, interest write off the tax benefit? Seven. So this is on a monthly seven fifty five and 21 cents. Okay. Assuming that the same hundred thousand member, the assumption yep. is a hundred grand in, in household income uh, to qualify for these. Perfect. And then how much was the gap between rent and purchase? Uh, you got six hundred and thirty-six dollars. Okay, so now we're negative one hundred and twenty when we factor in tax benefit. Yeah, exactly. And so what we 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 don't want to overlook the fact that you have to stroke a check for thirty-five forty-nine versus twenty-nine hundred. I mean, obviously that's it's harder to do, but for that's sure. one way. I, I just wanted to make sure people know. Yeah. Don't when you you sign up to go to work. If you're not self-employed, you fill out your W four form. And you set it and you forget it. Hardly anybody revisits that thing until yeah. you change your job. Yep. You want to revisit it as your lifestyle changes. You have another kid, you buy a house. Like these are things that you need to revisit. You want to work with somebody who's a professional on that, somebody that maybe helps you with the taxes. Yeah. You don't have that person typically if you TurboTax or H&R Block. Mm -hmm. But if you see a professional with it, they'll be able to help you with this. They'll, they'll kind of tell you the safe ground based off what you have earned in the past. Another event would be your earnings go up. Yeah. You're used to making eighty or ninety thousand dollars a year. Now you're making buck twenty. It may bump you into different tax brackets. You get married, may bump you into different tax brackets. You get divorced, may bump you into different tax brackets. Yeah. So all those life changes need a revisit on your W four yep. and a consultation with your tax person. All that being said, sometimes there's hidden money in, in that you don't even you don't have to go earn more. You need to keep more. We just need to, to make sure that we're revisiting what we're bringing home, right? And yeah. That's one way to help you kind of bridge the gap. We'll get to the, the main benefit on this here in a second, but yeah, to your point, 636 more a month, but 755 on the tax benefits. So yeah, it's already favoring the, the housing, right? Yeah. Yeah. The house or, you know, the individual, because we're talking about mm -hmm. actual houses, you know, the individual, your net profiting 120 month with the set tax savings alone. But yep. again, you're right. Writing that check sucks. 
yeah, when it's twenty five percent more. Want to overlook that? I mean, it's it's definitely still got to peel off that check, so we want to make sure we we address that. Right? For sure. But, okay, so now let's let's go into this graph here. So we've already talked about the the net uh, benefits on just on the monthly taxes. There's there's one more. Let me let me touch one more of them, which is principal paid, and this is oh, yeah. oftentimes totally overlooked, right? You oh, got a sure. loan, it's a 30 year loan. And essentially, if you bought this house in 30 years, yep. like we're just doing that comparison long-term, assuming you never move. Yep. 30 years, you're still gonna owe the landlord rent. Mm -hmm. But in 30 years, you've stroked your last payment, you're just paying your property taxes and insurance. So that payment goes away. So part of what we have to not ignore, and we have to pay attention to is the fact that when we buy a house, a portion of our money that we pay every single month goes to principal. Yeah, it's it's you're paying off debt, but I want you to really look at it like I'm putting that money away. It's like you're forcing some savings, right? Because yeah. essentially you're building an equity position. Let's say this house never goes up in value. It stays exactly the same. You're slowly taking away that debt to a point where you're going to have all of that in equity position over time. Yeah, just like stacking up a savings account. So in that scenario, the, the principal paid is about $530. So now if we take the, the tax benefit and if we look at the, uh, the, the forced principal, yeah. the savings, if you will, yep. our net pay is $2,263. So we're actually better already. But yeah. again, you have to look at it in a different way. We're better than the rent mm -hmm. at that same price. So when we, on the surface, we looked at it, just to recap. Yep. $2,900, $3,549. Most people go, $2,900 is better. Yeah. I'm going that route. And I agree with you, but I think you have to take time. You have to really dive a little deeper into the whole entire scenario. Yeah. We'll find out that actually owning that home at the same price point, significantly better for that for that homeowner. For sure. It's so, And then a couple of things to touch on with that is the forced savings account is massive. Most people don't think about that. Um, yep. but the purchasing and having a mortgage. So that debt that you have is a finite debt. It will go away. I mean, as long as you choose to allow it to go away, right? You'll pay right. that debt off. You won't have it anymore. But when you're paying rent, that's an infinite debt. Like it, like that is never going away. At least when you're purchasing and you have that monthly payment, there's light at the end of the tunnel on it. You know what I mean? That will go away to your point. Um, the other thing is that, you know, when we talk about this, like every time is controlling your housing expenses, right? So the mortgage, uh, the only time it, it'll go up, but can go down, um, you know, out of right. your decision-making process with your property taxes, right? So yes, it can go up ever so slightly each year. Um, and it's a 3% of the property tax increase, right? Much smaller number, uh, and that's fixed as much as it can be. But a landlord, I mean, it, there's no guarantee on that. And especially if you move houses. Well, so with rent, now that we have rent control, it's it's 5% plus cost of living, right? So right now it's eight or 9% of right. the monthly payment mm -hmm. versus when you buy, it's only, is the cap 3% uh, annually on property tax increase? On, on In LA County, on property taxes, it's 2% per year, per okay. annum. So and it's 2% of the tax amount, not of the monthly payment amount. Exactly, yeah. So, I mean, just, I'll, I'll pull up a calculator because I'm not uh, Yeah. I'm not feeling that number today off the top of my head, but let's just say it's uh, your 6,500 bucks yep. on your, your tax roll, 2% of that is $130 for that year. That's not monthly, that's just your year in potential tax So $10 increases. a month, roughly. Correct. Okay. Now, what we said that rent was twenty nine hundred. Yeah. So, so what's when I 8%? did this modeling, I actually used a I used a very conservative. I used three percent for an increase. But let's take it to the full throttle and say we got eight percent. Yeah. That eight percent is two hundred and thirty two dollars different. So meaning your first year you'd pay twenty nine, and if you had a really savvy landlord, they're going to impose eight percent because right now we know rents are going completely crazy. They don't yeah. want to get left behind knowing that they have a cap on how fast they can increase it. So they're going to increase it to the max every single month to make sure they have the most profits of business. Yep. So, Man, but hold on, that was, you said it was 239? 232. 232 per month. Per month. Not 130 right. per year. That was $10 a month. 
Yeah, you got 2784 for the year, right? Yeah. So so the 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 difference you got $2600 different in potential adjustment. Yeah. So where the the rent feels safe because the mortgage is all oh, a property tax that could go up, it's a little bit scary. The rent feels really safe, but is it? Because it you could find a landlord that doesn't adjust ever. Could. Could. You could find a landlord that says you can live in here forever. I'll never adjust it. You could find a landlord that decides that, you know what, they're going to sell the house because it's worth a lot of money. And now you have to go <laughs> find another place to rent. And guess what? It's gone up because the market price on rent, they're, and they're running like 10 And there's no cap right on now. that. Right. Get it? Well, so on the new rent, you can't go to the new landlord at the new house and go, hey, you know, I paid 29 and I know you're asking 32. You can't change that, right? Like, no, it's a fresh rent. You yeah. can charge them whatever you want. So yeah, so there's no cap on that one. They have protection for their existing home, but they can only move it up so fast, right? Yeah. So if they started off at, at $2,500, yeah. um, they can't go the next year and go, oh, it's 3,000. Like yep. there's going to be a, a limit, right? That's what rent control does. But rents are moving at such a fast pace. We, we think that a lot of landlords are going to be somewhere between that five and 8%. They're going to maximize it. Yep. When I did the modeling, I was looking simply at like 3% and it still made a ton of sense on the purchase, but we'll, we'll jump into that in a minute. Yeah. And then, yeah, we don't need to dive, deep dive on that. Okay. Um, all right. Are we good on uh, the rent versus principal paid here? Yeah. Let's look at, um, some other areas that sometimes are overlooked. Again, we're looking at the monthly payment difference. We're making a decision, but we need to pay attention to the entirety of this whole decision. This is a big deal. Housing to rent at $2,900 is a big deal. Housing to buy at 35 and some change, that's a big deal. Where else do we have some gain? Well, when you rent, the landlord isn't going to share the equity over time with you. They don't. They get to keep it. That's part of the cool thing about being a landlord is... Yep. If we're a landlord, I'm getting the monthly rent. That's part of my my profit center. Part of my profit center is the equity growth over time. Yep. Somebody else is paying my debt off for me, and then depreciation. So that's kind of their game. As a homeowner, your game, if you're the the homeowner, is the appreciation level. So we start to look at like on the screen that you've got pulled up here. This is what I really want to drive home because this is oftentimes missed all the way through. Yeah. This model, what you're seeing where it shows appreciation after 15 years, this is basically using historical average. And where we got that number is the area, in this case, Palmdale, we looked at a 62, we did a 62 year look back. Yep. So 62 years, how many recessions have there been? How many housing bubbles have there been? There's been a lot, right? Yeah. So half a dozen. Yeah, exactly. So 62 year look back. Because if we looked at like the last two or three years and said, oh, you know, house prices are moving 12% or 15%, it'd be totally unfair. It's, an un it's a very biased um, spreadsheet that we're doing. Yep. This 62 year forecast is historically 5.58% is what we've had for growth. Yeah. Year over year over time. Now, the forecast is actually a little higher. It's like 6.58 is what it is. But I didn't want to use that. I want to use the, the 62 years. 62 years got yep. more conservative. I want that longer kind of look back. So let's say you buy it now at 510. Year number one, you've been in the house for a whole year. You got that 5.5% appreciation. Your home is now worth $538,000. Yep. Year number two, 568. Year number three, 600,000. All right, let's just stop there for one second so I can kind of put it in perspective. We've only got three years. Yep. Now, the rent, if I use 3% adjustment, I kind of did the numbers here on my iPad. You started at 2,900. If you adjust at 3%, year number two, you're paying 2,987. Yeah. Year number three, you're paying 3,067. Now, remember, your mortgage is fixed, maybe a small property tax adjustment. And you made a great point earlier is that this is fixed on your housing, but it can go down. Yeah. Well, in three years, is there a refi opportunity? There could be. If refinances really move down or they, their rates kind of drop like we really think they will, there's a yeah. ton of people that support that. That mortgage has the potential of moving back down into the $2,800 range. Now you're cheaper than it would have started off with rent, but the rent's kind of gone the other way. It's gone up. Yeah. And you missed out on that that third year if you're worth six and you paid 510 you've missed out on ninety thousand dollars in 
in net worth or appreciation. Yeah. Now, so that's amazing. Let's, and let's let's, let's step talk back about real that, quick. I think that that's key. That that appreciation model right there. I think we really need to spend some time on. Oh yeah, the net worth is huge. And now let's go back to the very beginning of this when we were saying like, okay, if I'm going to rent and it's the twenty eight or twenty nine hundred dollars a month that it is, and it's only eight thousand dollars out of pocket. That mm -hmm. seems in the moment to make a lot more sense than the what was it thirty eight thirty six thousand dollars out of pocket um, on a purchase. I, I think I was using thirty nine k down payment, yeah. closing costs, etc. Right, like using everything in there. So yeah. so day one thirty one thousand dollar gap. Yes. So we don't want to ignore that. That was a ton of money. And you Time. paid more on the mortgage than the rent cost yep. by the tune of about $7,000 a year. Yep. So, so there's, there's definitely, you got to factor everything in. But what I'm saying is like in between year one and two, mm -hmm. you've recuperated the extra cost it took to get you in the door to own it. And you've, you've more than surpassed the extra cost it took to to write the checks for more money every month to live in that home. Yep. Not even factoring in the tax advantage mm -hmm. and the uh, what I call for savings or the principal reduction, right? Like yep. those two components already made the 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 net cost cheaper. But let's just take it for face value. Yep. Year number one and two, right in between there, it's actually cheaper to own. You've actually you're already surpassing the the benefit at that point. For sure. Another thing to look at before we move on on this one is that if you do rent for the first year, and so the the twenty eight hundred dollars a month that's gonna be thirty three grand in rent. So if you do rent the first year and you purchase the second year, even if mm. the prices are the same, your out of pocket is actually more expensive because you will have spent your eights or whatever it was to get into the rental, right? And then the actual rent amounts for that first year, call it 30, right? And then there goes the year one out of pocket on the purchase itself. Yeah, that's that's a good point. So that, that does come up every once in a while. We get somebody that says, all right, I'm gonna wait till the rates come back down before I buy. Yeah. And, and to your point, making that assumption that the house prices stay exactly the same. It, it would still cost them. You got, you're, you're bleeding out money on rent, assuming you have a housing cost somewhere. So in this case, yeah. 2,900 a month is the comparison. Um, that money goes out the door. You don't get that back. Yep. And in, in some ways, yeah, it does make more sense to kind of get in the door a little bit earlier and secure it. And then you can kind of manage that debt moving down over time. If there is a, if rates did drop by year two, yeah. Take advantage of it. You don't have to go out and try to house house hunt. Here's the thing. With rates being a little higher, it will stall the market just a tad. So you're yeah. going to have some folks that aren't going to move up from the, the entry-level house to the, the one that they really want or need. Yep. They're going to pause because they're nervous. Yep. And that puts a drag on those entry-level homes. Um, it makes the, the market conditions a little bit worse in terms of the inventory. It's not like a ton of inventory hits the market. It's less as it's going to hit it which actually pushes and fuels prices to go just a little bit higher. Yeah. If rates did make a dip, if they go from five and a half to three and a half, like they go completely back yeah. to where, you know, they used to be. Let's say they do that. How many buyers do you think are sitting there on the fence waiting to buy that are going to jump back in? Cause they're like, Oh my God, thank you. Finally, it's here. You know, All a of ton them. of competition again. So what's going to happen? The prices go right back up. So I, I don't think it'd be a tall tale to say, Hey, they're going to stay the same. I, I think you're going to pay more because there's going to be more people, more hungry folks trying to compete for that same home because they want to secure that price. Once you own it, you're competing against just really whatever the, the market is for rate. And you don't have to compete against other people for that exact house, right? Like you already own it. So. Yeah, for sure. The, the demand will spring load. Like mm -hmm. it may dissipate temporarily, but once the the rate if they came down if that's what people are banking on they come down and you have all of the people who were already on the sidelines wanting to buy and rates come down now they can afford it great that's a lot of pent-up energy right but also you have to look at the average buyer's age is 33 34 whatever it is right and if you say i have to hold off a couple years till rates are down how many more of those people that were not buyers at the time like you said they come of age and are now buyers 
and you have that pool of people that were waiting for rates to come down so they could afford. And, right. and the inventory is low because of the people that had those entry level homes that, you know, and probably at sweet interest rates of 3% or less, right? And they didn't move, like you said, because rates are higher now. And now they're not only biting off a bigger mortgage, you know, loan amount, but the interest rates way higher. And they go, whoa, 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 nope, I'm going to stay right where I'm at, right? So the demand is just going to be crazy on the back end of that. It, it's just mm -hmm. spring loading for sure. Yeah, I mean, here's the other thing too that I think is really, really important. So we were talking about three years from now. Yep. Um, so let's talk about return on investment. All right, so you put down to buy this house, 5% down, $510,000. It's $25,500. That's your down payment. I know that it shows 39, but there's closing costs, there's property taxes, there's insurance, there's all sorts yep. of other stuff you're paying for. Yep. The down payment itself, 25,500, okay? So you got... That's your investment aside from closing costs. Yep. But you got this this ninety thousand dollars using a sixty two year average of appreciation. This ninety thousand dollars in equity position over time. Yep. So the return on the money that you invested, the twenty five thousand, that's your your principal, your, your down payment, right? That goes against principal. You made three hundred and twenty two percent on that money. You know, let, let's you want, say that again. So $25,500 mm -hmm. got invested. Yep. The property goes all the way up. Now the bank doesn't partake in the equity gain, right? Like that's mm -hmm. the thing you're leveraging the money. You only put in a sliver, you put in five, the bank yeah. put up 95%, but you get all of the upside. Yeah. So in that scenario, it moves from 510 to, to 600. You've just made 322% on your $25,500 investment. On a safe bet. On a 62 year average. On a safe bet and on something that you needed anyways. Yeah. Right. Like and it, it's not a meme stock. Yeah. That's so awesome. That's just at the third year. Now, most people are staying in these homes somewhere around the five year mark. So yep. let's kind of redo that in five years. So the yep. percentage gain is 592% in five years. And using that, again, 62 year historical measure. That property that you bought for five ten should be worth somewhere around six sixty to six seventy. Yeah. And guess what? Your payment is still the same, but you've had five years of potential market changes to lower that payment and that cost down to drive that down. Yeah. And we used three percent kind of stacking on the rent. Well, five years from now, that rent that was twenty nine hundred is probably getting really close to thirty three or thirty four. Yep. Because they're stacking that over time. And that's assuming that the landlord doesn't sell on you in the first five. Yeah, for sure. So the ROI on your out of pocket on your down payment is massive. Mm -hmm. Right. So we've talked about that and the tax write offs are huge. Uh, the peace of mind and security on fixing your housing expense for the foreseeable future, huge. The fact that your purchase monthly payment can only go up ever so slightly. You, you know, with that first example we talked about, it was $10 a month versus the potential rent if you stayed in the same house was $230, I think you said. Um, mm -hmm. So those are all huge advantages. And you have the four savings account, right? Year three. Ninety thousand dollars in equity. Uh, what was your five? It was you were at six fifty. On the equity position. Sorry, just minimize that. Hold yep. on a minute. Uh, it would be. It's about a hundred and fifty nine to one hundred sixty thousand dollars. Amazing. Okay. Yeah. And you don't get any so, of those benefits on the rent. So there's that. <clears throat> Even though the rent up front is the easier pill to swallow. Yeah. And so again, with all this, I know there's a lot of numbers and a lot of data, but at the end of the day, there's most people take monthly rent, yep. monthly housing, do a compare, which one's cheaper, yep. right? Like it's like the little pendulum swings, rent's cheaper, go this route. Yep. But you have to do a deep dive. And that's why at the very beginning of the call, and we've said it before, Rent versus own is an individual. It's 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 each application, each person yeah. a little bit different because we could have somebody that comes in and they're going, look, I, I need a place to stay for a year. We just did the math on it. You really kind of 
benefit between year one and two. So yeah. the first year, if they're here for a year and they're pretty confident, like high likelihood that they're not going to hang around anymore, they're going to rent. Yeah. Like we're going to tell them to go rent. Don't yeah. buy. If they're saying, look, I'm pretty sure like we got at least five years here. Yep. Dude, hundred percent, as long as you can swing it. And we just showed you a trick maybe with using your W4 and, yeah. and withholdings to kind of help bridge that gap a little bit. Let's go to the purchase. Even in a peak housing price, peak rate. I mean, these rates are as high as they've been in, in since 2009. Yep. And you've got the, it's just some really, really high levels right here, but it still pencils out and you run the, um, the possibility of driving that cost down over time. Very rare that you're ever going to get a landlord to renegotiate your rent to a cheaper price. It doesn't happen very often. <laughs> very rare. All right. Uh, are we good on these two graphs to move on to the final? Yeah, yeah, go for it. Um, I just, I think that that was really, in this, this is kind of going on to that re return on investment when you're yeah. kind of looking at that. So, yeah. yeah. Well, the, so the one on the left, or at least on my left, I don't know how it shows up on your side, but where it shows that historical, it shows uh, $42,000 and in, in the return on investment is 168. Yep. The appreciation per year uh, rate of return. And that's what they're looking at. So that's your average over year, but we're, we're doing a 15 year study on this. So yeah, if we were to take it at, at the 15 year mark, see the, the return on investment starts to really stack over time as that property keeps going up in value. Yep. And because your original investment was still the 25, five. Yeah. So as that house goes up over and over and over again, um, it stacks up. And so in this case, you, you average around $42,000 worth of kind of year over year, but that number will change a little bit um, depending on how long you're forecasting. If you're looking at three years, that number is significantly less. If you're looking at it for 30, it could be even more. Yeah. We all know the story of like, you know, our aunt or uncle or mom or dad or grandma, grandpa that owned a home Yeah. and, you know, they stayed there for 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 years. And they're like, oh man, they paid you know, 60 grand for that house, it's worth $600,000 now. Yeah. So it's funny because like when we're running these numbers, we're going, mm, I don't know how that house is going to be worth a million bucks. Yeah. Well, back then when, re when reality was you could buy these things for 60, Yeah. Uh, I don't think they ever thought it would be worth five or six. So for sure. And, it, and well, and the fun thing with that, that is like those homes, like in, you know, 1980 when they sold and they were like 60 grand, right? The interest mm -hmm. rates were like 18%. Mm -hmm. And so the monthly payment wasn't much cheaper, especially relatively with inflation. Like it was just as difficult to buy then. And they did it. And back to the point of like, that almost killed me to write the check at 18% monthly, right? And this house was 60 grand, not a chance will it be worth $600,000 one day. Same thing with us looking at this one that was at 510 and like, dude, no way it'll ever be worth a million dollars. That gap is much easier to close than the 60 to 600. Yeah. So look in areas change too. I mean, here's the thing with real estate. That's super cool. Is like, I looked at a property this morning that was in Pasadena Yep. and you know, this, this home, it was nice but it wasn't anything over the top. It wasn't like a, a castle. Yeah. And, and I looked at it uh, because it, somebody I know had visited that property. and was like, Oh, let me find out like what that thing was worth. And it's an older home. Um, it had sold at one point for three eighty five. you know, and this is, we're looking back like 20, 30 years. It's worth over $4 million right now. Dang. Like, let that kind of sink in for a second, right? Like if that person bought 5% down at 385, their investment's minor. Like that's all they got. And then he's worth four mil. It's probably had some money dumped into it over the, over the years, but it was seriously lacking a lot of a, a new amenities. Like the kitchen looks like it's probably 15 years old. The, you know, yard is mature. Now the exterior's probably seen some updating over time. So there's probably more money that's gone into it. But my yeah. point is, they're not making any more of this land. And we, we hear that additive a lot where it's like, Hey, you know, buy it because they're not making any more of it. And you're yeah. Like, okay. Yeah. I look around, there's a lot of vacant land. That's the thing. Like my, my neighborhood, there's four homes being built right now. And there's, there, there used to be seven lots. There's only three. Yeah. Guess what happens to the prices? <laughs> like yeah. if you want to live there, if you want a view that, that I got, you're gonna have to pay for it. So 
it's it's the same thing with when you're looking at a neighborhood you're like oh those are cool houses and it's close to my kids school or it's close to work or close to the freeway you're making these uh, judgment calls on the house you start looking around and there's nothing else getting built there guess what you know you're sitting on a gold mine you just have to wait you can't play that six month you know one year thing you got to kind of play the long game yeah for sure it's yeah always play the long game i mean that's Mm -hmm. that's probably the biggest lesson i've learned in my real estate career is play the long game or at least consider it. Like, don't don't ignore it, right? Um, and you might have circumstances right here, right now that make you make a different decision than you would if you were solely looking at long game, but definitely at least consider it. Don't ignore the fact that it does exist. And then back to what I said earlier about uh, a mortgage, a purchase debt, your monthly payment is on a finite debt. But when you're renting, like that housing expense will very likely never go away unless you're renting from like a family member, right? Um, Right. So that'd be an infinite debt that you get nothing in return for. Yeah, you're committing to, you know, kind of an an unknown, like, you know, and and that's the thing, I think we mentioned this a couple of calls ago is that, uh, you know, people are worried sometimes they want this fixed cost and and they, they assume that rent is fixed. You know, they're worried about things adjusting, but rent's variable like you're it's fixed for a year and then after that it can it can adjust so it'd be the it's not even fixed for a year it's fixed for however long you sign that lease i'm assuming you signed a a year lease yeah exactly but it doesn't have to be a year lease either correct you're right so yeah but assuming you you did a year lease like you got a fixed payment for a year yeah and then it's like signing up for a mortgage it's like okay here's your payment it's fixed for a year and then after that it's going to adjust yeah um People would look at you and go, no, I'm good. <laughs> yeah. But somehow we we do it okay with with uh, rent. Yeah, it's crazy. All right. So anyways, I, I hope that helps because, I, I mean, really, that's how we look at it in the office. It's how you look at it at your office. I mean, yeah. we're really kind of looking at things. And when we can give somebody the, the confidence, like, yeah, I think it's still okay to purchase. Yeah. It's coming in the, you know, from listening to their specific scenario but it's also coming in the spirit of understanding all of those mechanics that go into that home purchase and seeing all of those various benefits yeah. and evaluating that against all of the risk, right? We don't yeah. want to ignore the fact that you're going to have to spend more money every month on that mortgage payment in today's market. Yeah. However, we think as long as you're doing that purchase, like assuming you can afford either one mm-hmm. and assuming that you're going to be in town for more than two years, that's yep. what I would use. I'd go the purchase route, right? I'd roll the dice on that. I think that has a lot more upside and a lot of people are kicking themselves. There's a lot of people that I know that sold in 18 and 19 because they thought the market was crashing who are still renting. And like, if if they were to see the numbers like like this, yeah, the appreciation gain and all that stuff, like, dude, that's such a huge swing to their net worth. It's crazy. Well, and you said, you know, off the cuff people, 18 and 19. And what I don't think other people realize, you know, because they thought the market was going to crash. The reason why, and we talked about this last time, was at the end of 18, our interest rates got to almost 5%. And it was up drastically, just like what we're feeling right now. Same exact thing happened. And beginning of 19, number of homes that were selling dropped. And so people thought the market was going to crash. They played the short game on that, whether it was to their benefit or not. But what you just said was it wasn't for everybody's benefit. It was people hedging and they were wrong. Yep. So it is what it is. Um, All right. Anything else you want to touch on before we take off? No, I I think that's it for now. I mean, I just want to kind of leave it with, uh, with that. Somebody can kind of look that over. If they need any of these slides, we can provide them. Yep. You know, we can do this stuff on um, per property. So, you know, if somebody wanted to reach out to me or to you and say, Hey, I'm kind of considering, this home for for rent. Yep, we can look up that area and find a house that's similar for sale, and then do the do the analysis for them so they can see it. Yep, it happens to work out. Like I didn't, I, I just chose literally one home. It's not like I went through fifteen and found the one that kind of penciled the best for uh, yeah for our benefit. Wasn't cherry picking. I chose one home and I stuck with it. And I'm like, let me do a test. Like if this really is better, I'm going to tell the audience like it, it's better to rent. Yeah. Um, so we just did one test. There, there are areas sometimes where it makes a heck of a lot more sense to rent. Yeah. If I ran this in Huntington Beach, I might get a totally different analysis because yeah. it, to rent for 4000 or 4500 a month might be way cheaper than nine grand for the mortgage, right? So 
um, you have to kind of like evaluate the area, but um, especially like where we're at in Palmdale, I think a lot of people see this. That's one reason why there's still a lot of folks that are moving kind of fresh to the area, so. For sure. All right, Ryan, thank you for your time today. Um, and Thanks. guys, we will put those slides in the chat. So you'll have those. And like Ryan said, if you want us to run any examples on a specific house or a scenario that's closer to what you are looking at, we are more than happy to do that. Perfect. All right, All right guys, have guys. a great Friday. Bye.